And now that we're recording, I will tell you that I woke up at 417 this morning and I have been awake since 417 this morning because I am so excited about our guest today. Our guest today has been requested by many of you and her name is Dr. Whitney Battle Baptiste. Uh, she has said that for the purposes of today, we can call her Whitney. And um, I could talk for the whole hour about um, the work <laughs> that Dr. Battle Baptiste has done and why it's so exciting she's here. Um, I'm gonna try not to do that um, so that you <laughs> can have a chance to uh, talk with her instead of me talking about her. Um, but I will put a link into the chat where you can, if you want to, oh, I'm gonna have to do it in a minute, I'll do it later. If you want to uh, look at her work, at her books, all of that, uh, you can do so in our form. I'll put a link in there later. But essentially what I wanna say is that um, Dr. Battle Baptiste is the founder of uh, a, a discipline really, and she's written a book about it called Black Feminist Archaeology. And in terms of what we're trying to do here as practitioners of data equity from around the world, she has managed not only to kind of break through the myth of objectivity, um, in breaking through that myth, she has been able to kind of create, to flip the script and create an entire discipline within her field that harnesses the strength of her position to do great work. So not only is she uh, breaking through the myth, she's actually flipping the script and embedding deep equity into her field, uh, which is Black Feminist Archaeology. And she's also the director of the W.E.B. Du Bois Center, which uh, I know that lots of us have been reading that book, which Dr. Bada Bautista is the editor of um, the book of um, Data Portraits Visualizing America. So that's all I'm going to say now. <laughs> it's taking a lot of restraint, <laughs> but um, I'm going to now turn it over to uh, Dr. Bata Baptiste, and uh, she's going to talk a little bit, just do some, some setting the stage so that we can have some understanding of what it is she's working on and thinking about. And then, um, then we're going to open it up to you folks for your, your live questions and answers. So over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Heather, for inviting me. Um, I'm going to share my screen. And of course, um, we all are in Zoom all the time, but uh, you know, oh, of course, oh, one second. No pressure. Okay. It's an informal, okay. casual Q and A there, no worries. <laughs> Why is my presentation at the end? Wow. Okay, hold on. <laughs> because it's Friday. <laughs> yeah. Because it's Friday mm. and we've been in a pandemic for two years. <laughs> so <laughs> that's just how life is right now. No worries. I really am flipping the script right now. Okay. Um, <laughs> yeah. I appreciate that the, the concept of flipping the script because um, I am, you know, uh, I've raised in the Bronx, New York. So um, as, as the founders of hip hop music, it is um, often good to hear um, hip hop references in, 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 in the work that I do. So I wanna give you a really kind of brief synopsis of kind of the work um, that I set out to do. Um, and I would have to say the type of work that I set out to do in many ways, I was discouraged from doing it as a junior scholar, as um, an African-American archeologist, and then as a black woman archeologist. Um, and so, you know, the, the pressure was to be archeological as possible. Um, and when I say that the field of archeology, span what archeology span um, really is, is the study of human history through material remains um, and through the act of excavating sites. Um, the reason why I say to be archeological is that um, my area of, of Americanist archeology span is in historical archeology, span which is already from the beginning a problematic term. Um, historical archeology span refers to archeology span post 
1492. And if you remember, um, there was some rhyme or something about um, a dude named Christopher Columbus discovering America in, in 1492. Um, I, I, he didn't discover anything. It's hard to discover a place where people live. Um, but the breakdown between historical archaeology and prehistorical archaeology is European contact. And so um, the field is historical archaeology, but a lot of us call it pre-contact, post-contact in order to acknowledge the fact that it was the contact that establishes a break in, in the discipline itself. So I just wanted to kind of lay that groundwork while you look at these two structures. Um, so archaeology, uh, the basis of what we do is excavating sites. And those sites are not necessarily the built environment, but what is left behind after the, the structures are gone, after the site is no longer in use, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so I'm take you through a little brief, um, oh goodness, I don't, okay. A little brief um, um, kind of reckoning of how I wanted to approach um, the archeology. span And so I, I put this quote up, um, this is from Bell Hooks, um, may she rest in power. Um, and it, it, it is about how, um, understanding the place that material objects have in our lives, right? Is very, very, is very different for various people. Um, but this particular one really strikes me because Bell Hooks is talking about finding out um, who she is through the things and the place that is her grandmother's house. It is also a place where um, Bell Hooks talks about growing up in an apartheid South, also known as a Jim Crow South, where your body is not safe when you leave the, the confines of your house or your immediate community. And so in this place, right, the importance is the structure, you know, the food, the interaction, and it taught her how to have her own sense of who she was. And so for me, approaching archeology span was really about going into it, trying to find the very things that I had in my growing up and how they related to how I was going to try to approach um, my research. Um, so, Okay, so just a, a, a really blurry picture, but um, this is a picture of my great grandmother, um, um, Hattie Elizabeth Shaw, and three of her children of the 12 she had. And this was taken in um, Rocky Mount, North Carolina. Um, and so although I'm born in Harlem, raised in the Bronx, for the most part, because my grandmother, because I'm the granddaughter of the Great Migration. so. My grandparents came up um, from North Carolina and settled in New York City. And um, that's actually where my grandparents met in Harlem. And um, however, I, I, you know, part of, and this is actually my, my next project way further down, um, is actually, you know, complicating what we think about as race, right? Because um, my great grandmother, uh, Eastern Band Cherokee, um, her husband was black and Eastern Band Cherokee. And so we are racialized as African-Americans. And does that, do you have to choose between indigenous and African? And, and how, it, how is, are that, is that racialization, specifically with Eastern Band Cherokee, is much more complicated because they are the ones that did not walk that's how it said, they're the ones that did not go on the trail of tears. They are the ones that stayed and were hidden in plain sight. So they became either black, white or mulatto. And it often depended on the person taking the census, which is data. So we'll see what happens in the years to come as I do my research. But um, in this concept, I do want you to understand that although my folks are from North Carolina, I grew up in this place called Co-op City in the Bronx. And 
um, I like to show this because it shows water and it shows trees and it shows that you know you can be in the Bronx and 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 it is varying landscapes. It's not just the urban is um, yes, I didn't have a yard. And that's why I like to show this picture. Um, I grew up on the 16th floor um, of a 33 story building. One of it is actually in this picture. Um, if you can see my cursor, it's this one right here. Um, so the idea of looking at space, right? Although I'm, you know, I have intellectually, I have bell hooks in my mind and I'm thinking about how place and space define me, yet I'm on the 16th floor. Right. And so how can I possibly venture into looking at plantations? Right. Well, like I said, my grandmother, my great grandmother, who I knew when, you know, she passed away at the age of 99. Um, and um, they I, I learned about what it was like to be in a space where the kitchen was not in the house, right? The bathroom was not in the house. And so we talked a lot about sweeping yards and, and all the kinds of things that go along with this. And I really wanted, you know, archeology span to be kind of a conduit between the, the stories that my grandmother was telling me and, and, and me trying to figure out the, the African-American past, right? And um, my grandmother often kind of calmed me down and, and said, people just swept the yard because there was no grass and you didn't want to cut your feet or my great great grandmother emmeline um blunt um my grandmother always told me she was just mean and made us you know sweep the the yard every saturday it was like a punishment but it was a chore um and so it kind of also grounded me into thinking about don't don't not don't put too much into it but just understand that people do things for living reasons, right? And archeologists that sometimes have to be careful that we don't put too much explanation or the trend in African-American archeology span in the nineties was if you can't explain it, then it must be ritual. Like that's really a bad way to go because who is defining what ritual is and how do you understand this? Um, and this is why sometimes I pushed to talk about asking different questions, asking questions that come from a space of your own experience and not trying to completely separate your life experience from the research that you're trying to engage with. But here's the thing, if you are not African-American, if you are not a black woman, right? How can you practice black feminist archeology? span Well, what are the questions that you would ask of your own experiences and how do you then enter into dialogue that with other folks who might have similar experiences or experiences different from your own and that was part of what i tried to push in kind of you know trying to frame this um, black feminist archaeology but i do have to say that the person that put those three words together first was my advisor, Maria Franklin, who's at University of Texas. So I always have to give homage, you know, to 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 my mentors. Um, but I also I, I like to show this, this slide because a lot of times people don't think that I actually dug. So I actually did. I, I'm old now, so I don't do that anymore. Um, so. Um, I went from Colonial Williamsburg um, doing archaeology to um, Andrew Jackson's plantation um, just outside of Nashville, Tennessee, which was not really a positive place for me to be as, as someone who is of African and Cherokee descent. Andrew Jackson, like it was like a double slap, but I felt that this was the place where I was meant to do this research. So I, I stuck with it. And um, what, what, what I wanted to do here was to really look at the ways in which um, it, it, captive folks used the outdoors, right? It wasn't about these, these homes with individual families, but it was the artifacts that we found around certain spaces meant that they were communal spaces and all kinds of people were interacting there. And it wasn't about being inside and being separated. It was about a communal kind of thing. Um, and um, part of it also was dialogue. The, this was the one and only reunion of hermitage descendants um, that was held in 2000, the only one. Um, and on the right are um, a majority of the family and on the left are descendants that actually 
are a part of my larger religious community who practice African traditional religions. And you can see there's a little bit of a difference. Um, so the thing is, is on the left, right? They were not only drumming and singing and dancing, pouring libation and saying the names of those whose names they knew. And in this practice, you know, I thank them for doing this. And I also asked them to do this because I said, this is also gonna help me um, finish my dissertation. So thank you, because I believe in, in community, but also in the energy that the community brings to, um, to the space. So I'm gonna quickly go to the island of Eleuthera, which is in the Bahamas. And where I am going to talk about is right down here at the very end of the dolphin tail, um, Miller's Plantation. So Miller's Plantation, thousands of acres, about 2000 acres that was actually given to the descendants, um, the, the captive descendants by um, the, the daughter, uh, Ann Miller, who never had any children, um, although Laura is, she did have children, they just weren't white. So, I, you know, if you have a question about that, I can um, answer that. But um, Miller's plantation um, was, was basically given because they were cotton planters that came from the Carolinas, most likely North Carolina. They came down, they were loyalists. The Millers were loyalists. The British gave loyalist land in places like Jamaica, Barbados, Bahamas, and, and other places like that for them to settle. Um, what happened was that they did not, <laughs> they were not able to grow cotton in the Bahamas. And so plantations failed and everyone, as they do today, everyone just went to um, um, Nassau, which is where everyone goes. Um, and so, um, this plantation was left dormant, quote unquote dormant, but yet it was lived on by families. Um, and so the descendants wanted to kind of fig talk about these structures that are still standing in terms of how they, um, how they interact with them as not of spaces of despair, but spaces where people lived in until the early 1970s. Um, 60s and 70s. The thing is, is that trying to do archaeology when the buildings are built literally right here on stone was really funny to Bahamians. They're like, what are you going to dig? How are you going to dig the stones? What we want to tell is the stories of the people who were here, the connection. Um, and it was also a court case that a developer was trying to take the land. And the community was a Bahamian developer was trying to take to, to buy the land because he said no one lived there. Regardless of people not living there, the memories of people using the spaces and cultivating it in very different ways led to um, my wonderful graduate student, my former graduate student, she's actually a doctor now um, and a professor. Instead of doing archeology, span we actually did, she did an amazing oral history project and um, all of the information and the stuff that we found out is now housed in libraries across Eleuthera for children and teachers to use as resources, to, to learn about the island and, and what the island did and contributed to um, the larger uh, uh, story of, Baham of the Bahamas. And so I like to show this picture because sometimes archeologists, when we don't dig, we just think a lot and we're just looking and, and thinking here. Um, so I wanna get to a very um, complicated topic and this is what I'm going to end with because I know I'm talking on and on. Um, so this is a, a quote from W.B. Du Bois. It's actually um, um, a record, it's based on a recording. And um, in 1899, Du Bois uh, found, uh, got wind or found out about um, uh, the murder and the lynching of a man named Sam Hose. And um, what, what this did was it really changed the direction that Du Bois took in terms of his work and, and, and using data. Du Bois was a dedicated sociologist when sociology was a very new field. And what he learned is that he was trying to go to the Atlanta Constitution to deliver a letter to the editor um, about lynching and how it has to be stopped, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and as he was walking on that street, he learned that 
the knuckles of Sam Hose, the man who had just been murdered, was on display in a butcher shop on the very street that he was walking. And then he said um, that, and so I changed from studying the Negro problem to propaganda, prep propaganda, to letting people know just what the Negro problem meant in what the colored people were suffering and what they were kept from doing. And he also talked about, this is the beginning of him critiquing Booker T. Washington and Atlanta University didn't really like that. So this is just before the first time he was kind of let go, quote unquote, from Atlanta University, which he also came into conflict with the NAACP at times as well. Um, so I do not show pictures of, of lynching or anything like that, but here is a rendering of what Sam Holes looked like. Um, and Sam Holes' death was extremely violent to the point of, of he was burned and he was shot and he, I mean, it was, and there were, there are many pictures of the crowd, which was huge. And many of them posing under Sam or next to Sam Hose's burned body. Um, and so this, right, right after this happens, um, W.E.B. Du Bois' 18 month old son, Burkhard Du Bois, dies because he is not, he dies of diphtheria because he is not, because he is a colored child, he is not able to get hospitalization or a doctor that was qualified to, to, to help him. And so he dies in Atlanta. He is buried in Great Barrington where Du Bois is from. All of these things happen. And then Du Bois is in a different space. So this is kind of the, the context of Du Bois and the um, American Negro exhibit in the 1900 exposition. And this is a picture from the colored American um, showing him there. Um, and, and there are pictures of Booker T. Washington up there because Booker T. Washington, it was his money and his, well, his fundraising and his um, endorsement that, um, that pushed the government to actually give um, uh, Calloway, Thomas Calloway and Du Bois the money to create this exhibit. And the significance of this exhibit is because in the 1900, the, the Paris Exposition still had anim, uh, human zoos. It was still showing kind of this eugenics of, of the inferiority of races. And here in this, uh, this American, this United States building, you have this, this very large exhibit that is showing um, property ownership, entrepreneurship, um, um, uh, historically black colleges, pictures, um, inventions, patents, um, literature, and again, the, the large numbers of um, um, data portraits that exemplified this. And this was probably the, the most visual and amazing product that was produced by the Atlanta School of Sociology, which um, Alden, Morris is, Alden Morris quotes as being the beginning of um, sociology, US sociology, although the University of Chicago is often giving credit. So I want to end there because I, 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 I threw a lot at you and, and, and I'm sorry, but I really, I'm excited about this topic and I would love to hear um, your questions and stop share. Okay. That was amazing. Thank you so much, Whitney. Mind blown. <laughs> and thank you for really uh, sharing specifically uh, the, the journey that, that, um, yeah, that you've gone on and then all the kind of contextual knowledge that's really important to understand. Uh, thank you so much. Okay. Yes. There are many, many, uh, clapped hands and uh, different emojis going across. Zoom. <laughs> uh, and, and I'm sure if I allowed everyone to mute, you would have a standing ovation right now. <laughs> um, yes. All right, so um, now we're gonna take questions. And um, we have some questions that were submitted beforehand, uh, but we wanna give priority for people who are in the room. So if you're in the room and you have a question, either put in the chat that you'd like to unmute and um, 
we'll arrange that. Or you can just raise your hand if you're comfortable using the raising your hand emoji. And we'll give the people in the room a minute and then I will switch over to the questions that people submitted on Twitter and in the forum. Yes. All right, so while you all in the room think about raising your hands, one of the questions uh, that was submitted beforehand um, is very practical. Mm -hmm. And um, this person is saying that they are also trying to, let me read it right. They are also trying to get research uh, that, that, that for, forefronts positionality in a quantitative way through the peer review process. And they're getting rejected by journals who say they can't actually find peers to review. <laughs> um, have, you, have you had any experience on that? I mean, do you have any suggestions or ideas? Like, I know you said you faced discouragement when you were starting out. Um, was part of that discouragement like institutionalized? Like you couldn't actually, because I know I'm not an academic, but I know that getting things peer reviewed is I think quite important for success mm -hmm. in your academic journey. Um, what forms of kind of institutional discouragement did you face? And do you have any ideas for other people who might be able to work around them successfully? Yeah, that, that's a that's a really complicated question, but a question that doesn't have to be complicated. And I'll say why I don't think it needs to be complicated. Um, so the first like article, it was uh, it was in a graduate seminar, and we got together. We did a paper at a conference, and that paper turned into an edited volume called "Household Chores and Household Choices," and. The review for my chapter, I had two reviewers, um, which I actually figured out who they were. Um, but one said that it, it was awful, my grammar, my writing, my voice, it was just, uh. and the other person said, these were both women, and the other person said, this is the future of our discipline. This is the way we need to go. This is the kinds of approaches we should take. Now, I was devastated by that first one, um, but that second one, who you know still remains in many ways a mentor, that second one created that balance for me. And everyone doesn't have doesn't have that to happen. You might send something in to review, and then you get two really bad reviews. And then what do you do with that? I would say you keep pushing and you find another space. However, as, as, as right now, I'm, I'm one of the associate editors of Transforming Anthropology. And I have to tell you, we have what we sometimes call developmental editing, which means that we are embracing folks who are looking at alternative ways to look at data, to look at the aspects of anthropology and transforming anthropology is the journal for the association of black anthropologists. So the tradition is that, you know, what we want transforming anthropology to be is to raise up in the ranks of what you need, right? What is qualified for being tenurable, right? If you post in the association of this journal, then it's, it's, it's at the top. Like, so there's top, there's hierarchies within journals. Um, as far as I'm concerned, the reason why it shouldn't be, the reason why it shouldn't be that difficult is that now I am a full professor. I should be in the room when it comes or, or on an editing board that comes to shifting the ways in which people are reviewing articles, right? In the same ways that shifting the ways that people are being promoted to full or gaining tenure. Right, or being awarded tenure, we have to translate what community-based research is. The fact that it takes longer to do, the fact that there are many aspects of when you engage with living people, archaeologists like to deal with dead stuff and, and stuff, right? But the ideas behind kind of, you know, dare I misquote Shirley, Shirley Chisholm, that says, if you don't have a seat at the table, you bring your folding chair and you open it and you sit down, right? 
I, I used, I, I think of that, right? Because a long time ago, someone told me that I'm, I'm too, I've been called a lot of things, but I'm too whatever, right? <laughs> to be in the academy, I'm too whatever. Yes, I wear braids and big hoops and I listen to hip hop. So I can't possibly be a full professor at a state university, but I am. And I, I'm unapologetically black and I am unapologetically who I am. And part of that is, is being at that table. I no longer am on the folding chair, but the truth is, is that we who are in spaces and places of power need to understand that we need to catch up and we need to not be bitter at our own experiences. And we need to make the experiences of the generations that are coming more adaptable to what other folks are doing because it's the only way for us to move forward. Um, so just keep finding a journal, find a, find a community that's going to support you and then tell your institution that this journal is respected in this particular field and you need to get over it. You are getting another emoji based standing ovation. <laughs> People are just jumping around. Thank you, that's a really, really great answer. Um, I'm opening it back up to people in the room. If, if you folks don't raise your hand or put questions into the chat, I'm just going to keep going through the ones people submitted on Twitter, but I don't want to always prioritize people on social media. So, oh, good. Somebody has their hand raised. Great. Tons of people. Alexandra, let's see. Let's unpack. Um, hello. Can you hear me? We can. Yes. Excellent. Thank you for such an insightful and thought-provoking discussion. As Heather said, definitely standing ovation from all of us. I, I was really struck by the combination of points that you made about not reading too much into things, right? That sometimes it's, it, you know, we can put too much meaning based on what, where we come from, but then also your, your exploration of, you know, could you be a black feminist archeologist if you're not a black female? And that struck home for me in thinking about how do we address the fact that like my experience as a woman, my experience as a mother might be very different than someone else's experience of being a woman and being a mother. And do I actually have any more right to speak to an interpretation of, of data or facts about those classes just because I belong to them? Or, or is there a different way of, you know, how Heather talks so much about opening yourself up to new possibilities and new questions. You know, how do, how do you tread that? And how do we explore that in terms of of our interpretation of data and the questions that we ask and, and how we bring our own identities to bear? Um, great question, thank you. Um, and first of all, I, sometimes I feel like, you know, if you choose to have children, um, I feel like you should be given some credit in the academy for like doing that. But, and, and if you choose not to have children, you should get credit for that too. Um, anyway, but the, I, first of all, it's, it's about dialogues for me. It's about reading outside of your comfort zone to get a sense of, um, to get a sense of kind of what's out there in some ways. And, and where do you start? How do you know? Where do you find it? Part of that is the exercise that I felt, um, um, and, and, and I'll use an example, uh, uh, a very good friend of mine, Carol McDavid, um, who's uh, from Texas, an archeologist, she, um, not a black woman, and she was asked to review the book. And she said she was afraid to review it because she didn't think that she would be able to speak to what I was trying to encourage, to get at. Um, and then she wrote me a personal note and then also put it into the review itself. But what she said is she was so surprised at how much of what I was talking about and sharing that she could relate to in her own experiences. So if we begin to try to kind of forgive, forgive my were excavate, right? Because <laughs> they are layers to who we are and our identities. If we begin to excavate and figure out the layers of who we are, then we actually might find commonalities that, you know, that speak to us beyond what we ever thought was possible and then open us up to reading things that then enhance your approach to and, and your interpretation. 
So it's about, you know, it's about, uh, as my as my colleague and friend Sonia Adelai, who is indigenous uh, Ojibwe um, 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 archaeologist, talks about the weaving, right? The weaving of knowledges, the weaving of the ways in which people um, experience life, but experience life in different moments and different times. Because I'm 50, I'm glad to be 50. I'm 50 years old, but what an archaeologist who's a black woman in her 20s is experiencing right now is very different than me but I can learn from her and vice versa. So I think that is really about that, that weaving together of different experiences and also finding commonalities. Because as we find commonalities, we begin to understand little crazy things like combating anti-racism and anti-Blackness actually helps all humans, not just Black people. Right. So it's 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 for me, it's it's that it's that those discussions across borders. Because borders are usually colonial, right? So let's down with the colonists. Okay. Hi, Sue. Yeah. Good afternoon and, and thank you for a really rich um, glimpse into your, your body of work, uh, which is really valuable and important. Um, actually, the prior question was my question. Um, so I'll go a little bit deeper um, and, and ask about what have you seen breaks down the dialogue? what have you seen breaks down the weaving? Um, and, and what are some ways that maybe you've seen uh, that be addressed successfully, right? Because, um, you know, in, in questioning, um, you know, my positionality as a white woman in, a, in a, an administrative position, um, I, I, I have experiences where that, that weaving and that dialogue breaks down. And, and I'm, I'm curious what kinds of experiences you've had around that. Thank you. Mm. Yeah, um, the breakdown is real, um, and and we don't uh, we don't always get along, and that is uh, that is okay. And I've learned that I feel like the uncomfortable conversations that I've had in my experiences have resulted over time have resulted in a richer understanding for all parties included, in, including me trying to be, listen to this perspective, this is what you've got to see and not, and being kind of committed to wanting folks to see a, from a certain perspective, but then realizing that you are not even seeing anything that, that there are aspects of what you're doing that are blinded by your, or, or narrowed by your own experience. Um, one of the, an interesting, and, and this is related, but not really related, is um, I gave a talk um, in Brazil, in Sao Paulo, and there was an amazing, I, it, it was very teary at the end, and it was, many, many Afro-Brazilian women coming up after and, and engaging in dialogue to actually see someone who put Black feminists in archaeology in a space that I've, I've been to before, but I saw Brazil as like, you know, ah, African, right? And, but archaeology in Brazil is very not. And, and so having that, a person came up to me and said to me that, an amazing trans woman said to me, your work has helped us and our community be able to be seen as archeologists with a perspective. And I was like, oh, okay. I'm, 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 I'm unapologetically black and I'm also unapologetically heterosexual, but I'm not heteronormative. I'm really okay. Cause I, it wasn't something that I saw happening. It wasn't something, that I saw as giving voice to talking about sexualities and genders, right? Like I speak, like if race is a social construct, why can't you see that gender is a social construct? Duh. However, right, it was not even seeing that because that was never my intention, but my, because my intention was to write my story, my perspective. And what happened from that is, I was able to engage with, with communities that I had never thought that I was going to be able to not just engage with, but learn from. And so 
over time, those uncomfortable situations become potential to be not only friendships, but to help me to expand what it is that I thought I was doing. Thank you. Thank you very much. Awesome. We have a really interesting question in the chat that's been direct message to me. And it says, I want to follow up with uh, what Whitney said about the, the pottery shards. Um, as a data scientist, I worry about your example of assuming that anything I'm not familiar with is either really important or not important enough. Um, such as if I look at a piece of data from a culture I don't understand or a person I'm not familiar with, uh, is this an important ritual or does it just happen to be a bunch of pottery shards here? <laughs> the data equivalent of that. What would be the first couple of things that you would do if you were working with a data set from people with really different experiences than yourself? Um, part of the reason why I said that it, it was it was kind of tongue in cheek is it's it's also uh, a reflection of 1990s African American archaeology. What was first plantation archaeology, then became African American archaeology, then became African diaspora archaeology. What I'm referring to is the dependency in those days to um, have specific articles associated with African-American sites. So if you find, now the pronunciation varies, it's either colonial ware or colonial ware um, in, in Virginia, which is earthen made wares that were made from local soils and clays, but made in European forms. So the idea is we're indigenous making them and selling them to African-Americans or we're African-Americans making them probably both. Okay. Right. Then um, the idea of cowrie shells being found, blue beads, cowrie shells, colonial wear. It, it was almost as if, if you find, it, it was like a checklist of things that happen in repetition. Um, and also this thing called root cellars, which are subterranean storage pits, um, as jargon goes. But root cellars are called that because in the winter time they are near fireplaces, so they keep things warm so they don't freeze. In the summertime, the ground is cool, so they keep things cool so they don't spoil. This is an early form of refrigerator. African peoples in the Americas were not the only ones to use these root cellars, right? So what, if you were poor and, 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 and non-African, right? And mm -hmm. didn't own a plantation or people, you would have a structure like this too, because that's how you store food. So it's not a black thing. It is a storage thing, right? And right. that, that, that those would, actually sue those were those uncomfortable arguments where African-American archeologists who were very low in number began to push back and say, look, I know we wanna focus on the artifacts, but please let's stop saying, if you find a cowrie shell, a blue bead and a root cellar, that black people lived here. Mm -hmm. It's a little problematic. So in that sense, okay. here's the thing, going to the hermitage for the first time that was really deep because I go into the hermitage and I'm assuming that everyone around me also is, is versed in African-American intellectual and African-American history. And I come and find out that no one around me has studied African-American history. If I was digging on a Greek site, I would be expected to understand the context of where I am digging. Just because you are from the United States, you have no idea what it is to, uh, to, to, to talk about slavery. And, and because I'm an African-American of indigenous descent from the Bronx, I have no idea what it's like to be enslaved or captive in Tennessee. So I too have to find out the context of the direct areas that I'm, I'm looking at. And that's why, that's, that's the pushback that I'm talking about. It's not actually about not using the data or, or just saying it's ritual. So the ritual part becomes, and, and the ritual part used to get me really upset because 
coming, being brought up in an African traditional religion as an African-American, I'm not Baptist, which already means that something's wrong with me. And then, I mean, socially. And then there's this idea that, that I, I'm talking about, you know, um, the Orishas and I'm talking about, you know, you're finding all these, this metal and you're finding these, these, these chains and they're, they're where the floor would have been. To me, that says Ogun, right? That says, that says the, the, the deity of, of, of iron and iron work. Same thing if you're looking at Catoctin Iron Furnace in, in Frederick, Maryland. Ogun is prevalent there. So it's, it's for me, and I didn't want to be that ritual specialist. So I didn't, I, I, I never wrote about what my own personal experiences was in that light because I didn't want it to be, I, I didn't want ritual to be a bad word but I also didn't want people to dismiss me and only look at me to define what things were and translate them into some African traditional religious, I don't know. So I, I am critical of, of, of some archeologists that were using patterns to identify race and using the concept of not knowing what something is and just assuming and, 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 and for shorthand, just calling it ritual. So that's what I was really talking about. That really, really helps. And it's so connected to what um, data scientists are doing now in kind of looking at patterns and then applying that, uh, you know, pr they're predicting people's race <laughs> from patterns, which is the kind of data science predictive algorithm equivalent to exactly what you're saying. And it's equally as problematic, um, mm -hmm. you know, to, to do that. Uh, okay, I think we have time for one more question. Somebody in the room want to take it or... Should we give it to pre-submission? All right. So the last question I think is um, in your work uh, where you, uh, in, in the book, Black Feminist Archaeology, you talk about up in a part where you realize that the definition of home that was often being operationalized was much too narrow for the actual lived experiences um, of, of the people that you were learning about. And um, that caught my eye because I think that using definitions that are a, a cultural mismatch to somebody's experience uh, is one of the ways that we create an appearance of deficit in people that we're collecting data from. Like if they don't fit our definition of home, <laughs> like we, we have this idea about home as like, you know, the, the two or three rooms that you live in, in an apartment or, or in a house or something. And you wrote quite amazingly about how the home that was experienced was actually much broader than just those walls. And, and the family that was experienced um, was, was much more important. And that really got me thinking about um, how much, uh, is how much context is still missing from the way that we interpret data and the way we visualize data. Um, and I'm wondering if you could just as your last thing, tell us um, what do you really love about the Du Bois data visualizations that you think is missing from the data visualizations and the interpretation of data that we, that you, that's really common today? Hmm. That's a really huge question for the last one. Um, <laughs> you can pass. You know? <laughs> no, I, I, it's really interesting. I'm trying to, um, I think that uh, whew, households, the, the, the way I try to, especially when I talk to students about kind of place and placement of, of things and how people interact with landscapes, um, Geographies are becoming more and more important to understanding the African and African American and African diasporic past. Mm -hmm. um, you know, um, geographies, um, we have anthropologists and historians who are engaging with the ways in which space and land and, and, and all of that is, is so essential to understanding the ways in which even though if if you even if you've grown up with a certain practice of home, it's often shifted by necessity and how you have to live within different spaces, climates, what's available to you, et cetera. 
But what it was, was I would, what, what I often try to do is explain to my students, like, you know, before you go out, you know, when people used to go out um, to party and hang out, um, there's always a gathering place. Or if it's a, if it's a house party, there's, there's always this place where people gather. For me, parties I go to, apparently the kitchen is, is a, even if no one's cooking, somehow everyone ends up in the kitchen. And so, and then you realize, well, there's, you know, there's a living room, there might be a sitting room. And then look, everyone's in, in the kitchen on top. Like just, we're just crushed in the kitchen. Why are we? And part of that is comfort, right? But part of that is the relationship, especially, and I have some colleagues that do amazing work on, 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 on African-American, African, African diaspora culture and food, right? How food brings us together. And, 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 and a good friend of mine who's a chef, African-American chef talks about, you know, our, our survival food and which is then translates into soul food and how soul food is different than Southern food based on race, but also how the space in which food is cooked becomes this space of collective collectivity. And, and at the Hermitage, we found an, 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 an a below ground, and, and I talk about it a little, you know, a little bit in Black Feminist Archaeology, we found this space that was um, um, underground and it was a barbecue pit. It was obvious because it had half of a pig skull and barbecue uh, tools and things. So, you know, thank you ancestors, because they were like, in case y'all don't know what this is, here's the evidence, because sometimes y'all are not smart. So having that, finding that, realizing, and then all those artifacts that I discussed that were, you know, domino parts, um, fish hooks, um, beads, um, you know, um, all kind buttons, all, all kinds of things that don't point to women's spaces and men's spaces. Just like today, we have to have, just like today, I have two sons. I have to have the talk with my sons about how to be safe in the United States, how to understand how to interact with authority and et cetera, et cetera. Back then you needed a space to be able to teach and help your children navigate slavery and captivity. How did you and where did you do that? You do that in a space of comfort. You do that elders and children and, and people that are courting, which they used to, you know, dating, right? People who are interacting and meeting each other and, and this being away from labor is where the comfort is. So Bell Hooks talks about it as her grandmother's home. A captive person might talk about it as the fireplace because we see in, in, in the account books of lots of, of, of different individuals, uh, of plantation owners, that there was a lot of complaints about captive folks taking too long to eat because apparently they socialize. So for me, that is, is, is kind of how I see the different ways in which home is created, adjusted and used for what you need in terms of your own survival and your humanity. All right, that is so, so helpful. It's really gonna change the way that I think about some of the data work that we do. Thank you so much. Um, I, we're gonna have to leave it there. I'm sure we could go for a long, long time more, <laughs> but we're gonna leave it there. And um, we will, um, I'll just put a link. To, um, where you can keep asking questions, where you can keep sharing resources, where you can find the links to uh, Whitney's books, some videos, and um, we'll definitely be circling back. I definitely noticed, Whitney, you mentioned that you're gonna be talking, thinking more and doing some work in the future about how to define race. And that's something that we talk about every day, how to, how to collect data about that without doubling down on racism mm -hmm. and oppression, marginalization. So we'll be, we'll be circling back to get your thoughts on that as you have them. Um, I'll, I'll I really... be back anytime. Just let me know. These are great <laughs> All questions right. and I love helping. So thank you so much for inviting me and thanks so much for everyone showing up. I appreciate it. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> See everyone later.